Hey, hi, hello, welcome back to my channel. If you've been here before, just ignore this gaping hole here because we are gonna be talking about my favorite books of 2021. And a lot of them came from that shelf. So today we're gonna be talking about my top books that I read in 2021. Basically throughout the month, whenever I hit a book, I would that I absolutely loved and cherished, I put it on this list and then the top three from that list made it into this favorites and then from there I weeded it down even more from okay well yeah this book was really good and it happened to be the top one of that month but it necessarily wasn't like a favorite of all time. These 29 books are books that I love and cherish. I believe all of them have gotten five stars. There might be like a 4.75 that slipped in here but all of these are fantastic books and I won't be talking about 29 individual books because there are quite a few that are part of a series and the whole series made it on my list. So I'll be talking about those in tandem. This video might be kind of long, I might ramble, I might talk for a long time about certain ones of these books just because I absolutely love them, but if you're willing to stick around till the end, uh, I can promise you that there are going to be some shockers on this list and there are going to be some books that I think you should read and I'm going to talk about why that is. First up is one that I absolutely loved and I don't see enough people talking about it and that is Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of everything. This book slapped. This is a YA sci-fi. It's kind of weird but it's mostly about this young girl kind of coming to terms with the fact that her mom disappeared a long time ago and that she is kind of feeling alone in this world. Our main character is is she Mexican or is she Mexican American? I believe that she's Mexican American and that her mom was Mexican and that she was illegally in the States. And she kind of starts to investigate some different things and it leads her into discovering aliens. The book takes a really odd turn about halfway through because the aliens aren't a part of the story until about that 50% mark. And then once they're in the story, it really takes it to some odd places. But I loved this book so much. I read it all in one day and I did listen to the audiobook for it and I highly recommend checking out that audiobook because it was so good. It was it was just done really, really well. Didn't know anything about this book until I had picked it up. I found it on a list of books written by BIPOC authors and I was happy to look for a book that would fulfill a prompt, which was BIPOC authors. Author, and so I decided to check this one out and I'm so glad I did because it slapped so hard. One of the things that I really really loved about this book is the relationship between our main character and her best friend versus the relationship between our main character and her significant other or the person that she has an interest in versus her best friend's significant other and the person that she has an interest in. There is some LGBTQ plus representation in this book and it really does show you that not only is a, a boy, uh, a relationship in this case is love important to our main character, but also friendship and family. And it really harps on the fact that different relationships mean different things, but they're all just as important. I really loved the moral and the lessons from this and I loved the weird alien power superhero kind of vibes that it gave off in the end and I just really want to see more people reading this book because it kind of is unknown and from what I can tell on Goodreads it's not super loved by the people who have read it but I think this author did a fantastic job. Up next we get to talk about one that should not surprise anyone. Uh -huh. It is House in the Cerulean Sea. I read this book after pushing it off for a long time because I wasn't expecting to love it so much and I genuinely thought that I was going to reread it this year because I read it for the first time in January. I thought I was going to read it another time this month. That did not happen. I just did not have the time to get to it a second time, but I will be rereading this book at some point in my life. I truly love it and cherish it. It was on so many people's favorites of the year the year before, so I think a lot of people already know about this book, but in case you are unaware, this is the book about a man who is named Linus and he works for this department that basically sends people to orphanages where there are magical children to figure out whether or not these children are a threat or can live in society. And Linus is sent to this one orphanage where he is supposed to be watching out for basically all five children are kind of 
mm. but one in particular is supposed to be considered the Antichrist and they're afraid that Lucy is going to be a huge problem. It has the whimsy of the series of unfortunate events but it is for adults and it has such amazing real world issues. I've heard this book come up a lot recently because of people having some issues with the author, some stuff he said on Twitter. From what I can tell I truly believe that most of it is a misunderstanding. Uh, I, I haven't looked into it a ton so I can't be 100% sure of everything that is being said is true or false but I would like to say that there is some issues kind of behind this book but it is such a fantastic book and such a wonderful whimsical read. It was funny, it was sad, there is a LGBTQ plus romance in it and it just really hits you in the feels. Up next the last one for January is A Winter's Promise and then in February my first book that I read that I loved was The Missing of Claire de Lune. I freaking will not shut up about this series. I did not put the third book on my favorites of the year list. I did only rate it a four star and I still have not gotten to book four yet because I am afraid of it. But book one and two are favorites and I love them so much and I will basically tell anyone who loves fantasy to go read them. I've heard them compared to Howl's Moving Castle. I have not read Howl's Moving Castle. It's something that recently people have compared a lot of my favorite books to so I feel like I need to go out and read it. These books are following our main character Ophelia and she lives in this world where all of the different cities have been moved into arcs which are these like floating cities in the sky. Now different arcs are each ruled by a different god. I believe most of them are from like Greek but there are some other influences. The city that Ophelia is from is ruled by Artemis I want to say if I'm remembering that correctly. Everyone in that city who is a descendant of the god has these special abilities and Ophelia's special abilities are that she can read objects when she touches them so she can see like who owned them before her and what their life was kind of like when they were interacting with that object and then she can also walk through mirror so it's kind of like teleporting but she can go mirror to mirror. Ruling class of this city has decided that Ophelia needs to be married off in order to get rid of her to this like awful arc in the South Pole and so she is sent off at the very beginning of this book to go and marry this man named Thorn, arranged marriage, one of my favorites, and she finds him to be cruel and demanding and does not fit into their world very well but is trying to find her best way to fit in and also to revolt against some of the issues that she is seeing brought there. In book two we do get introduced to the concept of gods a lot more importantly in the story and in book three we kind of get to explore the world even more beyond the south and the pole that Ophelia is originally from and you just really get to see these characters grow and develop. There are so many amazing side characters. In fact I can't even name a character in these books that I dislike. Ophelia and Thorne together and separate are such amazing characters but watching them really slow burn pine for each other over the course of these few books was amazing. If you're a fan of the relationship development in Pride and Prejudice you're going to like the relationship development in this series and if you're a fan of strong female characters uh, standing up for themselves and not taking any shit from their male counterparts, you're gonna love it. Thorn is such a quiet, lurking, mysterious, dark presence in Ophelia's life and yet you start to learn that he really does truly have a heart of gold. He reminds me so much of a Darcy character type. And Ophelia genuinely is smart and strong and powerful in her own way and she does not let her limitations limit her in any way. I do want to say though that these are very slow books so if you're going into them expecting like a super fast plot that's not going to be something you're going to find and that they were translated from French to English so every once in a while you kind of get a weird word that maybe you wouldn't necessarily use in English that much but makes sense in this setting. Up next we have an author that I thought I was done with but after reading this book I'm not totally convinced that I am actually done with Neil Gaiman. So The Ocean at the End of the Lane took me for such a wild ride. First off it's a short book which is something that I never find myself enjoying and second off it's Neil Gaiman. Nothing against him I've just found that I haven't loved any of his books. I enjoyed American Gods. I feel like I kind of tolerated Coraline but I loved this book and let me tell you guys his name will be coming up once again later on in this video. So The Ocean at the End of the Lane is about this boy who well he's a man at this point. It's about this man who's returning to his home for a funeral and when he starts to return to his home he starts to remember these 
weird memories from his childhood that he doesn't understand why he would have forgotten them. And so it's kind of told as the memories were turned to him. You're seeing the story of him as a young boy as he's starting to learn about witches in his town and about his family and about adulthood. It's a very dark book. It's a very magical book. It is like a horror fantasy so be prepared for some scarier moments but it was so amazing. You have this loving family of women who kind of take him in and show him what it is truly like to live in this world. You have this adorable little like, friendship romance kind of development. They are young children so it's one of those things where you're like not totally sure if they're friends or if they have feelings for each other if they don't even understand what feelings really are at this point. It has some really 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 dark elements to it. My favorite thing about this book and the reason why I read this book in the first place is because it has an open ending. So the ending is open to interpretation and you're not sure actually how things are supposed to wrap up which I do believe is something that Neil Gaiman does a lot because I've seen it before in his works. I just truly loved the characters in this story and I really enjoyed the journey that we got to go on with them. It reminded me a little bit of a Dark Chronicles of Narnia-esque story because you kind of have this like English wartime setting against this like magical landscape. I really loved our witches and how feminist they were. I did listen to the audiobook for it and then I bought this copy online because I thought that it was going to have illustrations in it but I got the wrong edition so one day I might haul the edition with illustrations because it is so beautiful how they're done. If you ever see it in a bookstore and you get to stop and look at the illustrations, I highly recommend you do it because they are so great. Next we're going to be talking about a series that if you're shocked you shouldn't be or you should just watch more videos on my channel and that is going to be The Queen of the Tearling, The Invasion of the Tearling, and The Fate of the Tearling. This book made it onto the books that I have cried super hard in. I believe I cried the hardest in this book out of any book I've ever cried in but I will say that Karen Slaughter is trying to take a run for the money. I absolutely loved this trilogy. It is an older trilogy so a lot of people know about it already or have already read it if they are planning to but I freaking loved it. I believe it's classified as YA online but I truly believe that it is more of an adult series. We are following a girl named Kelsey and she has been kept away from the kingdom her entire life but she's next in line for the throne. In book one she comes to this realm. She is brought there by a bunch of soldiers because it is now her time to rule and she is starting to see how awful things have been run by her uncle in her place and she starts to make some major changes. So so one of the reasons why Fate of the Tearling made me sob so uncontrollably, no spoilers of course, is that the ending just hurts. The ending hurts. A lot of people did not like the Fate of the Tearling specifically because of the ending but I loved it. I loved it so much. This is set in the world where there used to be technology. It used to kind of be what we are familiar with and some people decided that that was wrong and kind of against God and so they went back in time almost and so they have some technology from where we're at but they've lost the ability to have a lot of the technology. So the world is kind of at a loss. They don't have books. They don't have uh, much knowledge. Their healing abilities are very limited. But our main girl Kelsey does have magic and she is fighting this woman. Is her name the Red Queen? And she rules this other land. It's definitely a giant metaphor for, you know, the Queen of England versus uh, the Red Queen. You know, the one. But also it's just fantastic watching these two women grow in power and grow against each other. There is some on-page sex in these books but it's definitely nothing that I would call smutty. It's not supposed to make you like feel happy and enjoyable in the books. It's supposed to make you realize certain things about certain characters. There are some flashbacks in here. Kelsey has this ability to flashback to her ancestors and so you get to see kind of the time period before this world became the way it was and what led it to be the way it was. Some of the elements of this book reminded me just a little bit of The Handmaid's Tale. Not with any anything that necessarily happens is similar to the plot of The Handmaid's Tale but some of the um, women are lesser in the first time period and should be controlled by their husbands. Definitely made me feel like if the book had gone in a different direction Handmaid's Tale would have happened. I truly loved this series. I rated all books five stars. I did also read the novella this year and I also rated this five stars but this is following a different character and it didn't stick with me. It didn't impact me as much as the other series so it didn't make it on my favorites of the year list. I can't stop thinking about this series so much and it's actually become such a favorite of mine that I put the Queen of the Tearling in the fourth slot of 
books of all time I have ever read. Now it's time to get into something that was tabbed the literal shit out of, and that is going to be Akamaf or A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J Maas. I never thought that SJM was going to make it onto my favorites of all time list. I read Throne of Glass a long time ago and I felt like they were okay for the most part. I really enjoyed some of them. I really hated some of the other ones. I got into the idea then that I was never going to read Akatar because she just didn't stick out to me as something like superb. But I had a friend tell me this past year that she really enjoyed Akatar and thought that I should read it. So I picked this up and then eventually I did read Crescent City. But out of all of the Sarah J Mass books that I have read, which now I have read all of them except for the novella in Akatar, this is my favorite and this really truly is just an amazingly good book. Sometimes you just want to read something easy and simple and you just want to have a good time with it. So I don't necessarily want to say what this book is about but I will talk a little bit briefly about book one in this series because this is the sequel to Akatar if you are unaware of that fact. So Akatar is Sarah J Mass's first adult series. Originally it was published as a YA but um it's spicy. So in Akatar, Feyre kills a wolf. She is living with her two sisters and her father. Their mother has passed and she kills a wolf in order to have food, warmth, winter, whatever it's called. A fae shows up at her house that night and says you killed my friend and for payment now you have to come and live with me in the fae realm and she goes to live with the prince of the spring court. Oh now I'm questioning things. So she goes to live with Tamlin and starts to realize that there's a curse upon the land and that she might be able to break said curse. It is a Beauty and the Beast retelling but book two picks up where book one leaves off and you start to realize that even and from there the world is still not how we thought it was and that Feyre might be dealing with some problems that happened to her at the end of book one and really all of her life. What really stuck out to me as amazing in this book is I liked how realistic the pain and depression and grief was developed in this story but I also really enjoyed a lot of the characters that we got to meet in this story. Of course I have my favorite, no spoilers, but overall I just think that this was a really well done book. I had some issues with it but the plot was so good and so fantastic. I know that it's hard to see but um, my tabs do mean different things so if I remember correctly yellow was things I disliked, green was things I thought were important to the plot and blue blue was things I loved, which of course those colors all just blend together to make green, but this was a really good read and I do think it was worth checking out. Next we're going to be talking about my other Neil Gaiman book that made it onto the list and that is The Sleeper and the Spindle, which is a very short, I think the audiobook was like an hour to two hours, retelling of Sleeping Beauty and it is a feminist retelling and it is such a weird fantastic little story. It's so short that I almost don't want to tell you anything about it because really just go into it blind and you're gonna love it. But I loved the feminist twist into the story. I loved the magic that was present in the work. I loved how Neil Gaiman wrote all these different fairy tales coming together. It is dark but I wouldn't say it's as dark as the ocean at the end of the lane. I highly recommend picking up the audiobook for this book because it is told with like a full production. So you've got sound effects, you've got different voice actors. Normally Neil Gaiman's books are narrated by him and I don't believe he was any of the voices in the story but it was still really fantastic and just really done well. Next we're going to be talking about Recursion by Blake Crouch. If I don't say it carefully I will say couch. I was so shooketh by this story. I've been wanting to read Dark Matter for a really long time and for whatever reason I decided to pick up Recursion first and I loved it. And it was funny because Dark Matter like really didn't hold up next to Recursion. Recursion is one of those books that once you know the giant twist it's kind of hard to talk about the first half of the book because the first half of the book is kind of a giant lie and once you realize that it's a giant lie you don't want to say it but whatever. Anyways let's talk about it. So it is about this world where there is this disease going around that alters people's memories and if you get this disease you believe in this whole entire alternate life that you had and it can drive people insane because they can see how good and wonderful their other life was and think that they will never accomplish it in this life and it can lead a lot of people to commit suicide. We start off with this detective police officer at the very beginning and he is trying to talk a woman who has this disease down off the ledge. 
Now, because of this interaction, he believes that he might have caught the disease from her and he is worried about him having an alternative life. He had a daughter who was accidentally hit by a car when she was, I believe it was like 13, 14 years old. And so he has to live with that guilt, which eventually led to his divorce with his wife. So when he starts seeing alternate life or starts thinking that he's seeing an alternate life, he starts wondering if maybe he could fix the problems that he had in his life that led him to having these issues. There's this other woman that we are also following and she is a scientist and she is trying to study, I believe it's Alzheimer's, and she is confronted by this man saying that if she comes and studies on his giant oil rig that she will have all the funding that she needs in order to develop this chair that will help cure Alzheimer's. It was such a good, high-paced, fast action book. It left me feeling like there was no way out. I truly felt like the story pulled me along and gripped me and that everything was hopeless by the end and that there was no way to change the course of this story. I almost cried in it. I got angry in it. I was happy in it. There is a romance that is developed and then destroyed and then developed and it is just done so well. I truly recommend this as a book for people who want to try some sci-fi that's more realistic because this is definitely a very realistic sci-fi. You know, sci-fi is never true to earth, but it is like based in our contemporary setting. So you're not getting into like space or into like aliens or anything like that. Blake Crouch really is a good writer and this book was just enjoyable to read from beginning to end. Next on the list, we're going to be talking about The Ruin of Kings, which is fun because I'm actually about to start rereading this book for this year. My book club read this together and we decided that we wanted to reread it before we continued on with the rest of the series. This is another very heavily tabbed book because of how much I loved it. The Ruin of Kings, we are following this boy and the beginning of the book starts out with him stuck in this jail cell and he needs to tell his warden the story of his life and how he got there. You know from the very beginning that he is the son of a prince but when you flash back into his past you find out that he's living on the streets with his father and you kind of can't figure out how to connect the two stories. So there's the past timeline where he is a small child and he is learning the skills from his father and then there's this other timeline when he's a little bit older and he has been sold as a slave to this like magical family and is living on this island training with them. And they kind of connect together eventually where you get him connected to the palace and you get him connected to why he's in the prison cell at all. And the whole entire story is what if you weren't the hero? So I do genuinely love this book. I love how it's written. The whole entire book is actually a police report. So it does have, what are these called? Why can't I think of what these are called? Footnotes at the bottom of the page, which help aid the story and give you more information about the world that you are living in. And the very beginning of the book starts out with this letter to the emperor explaining why this police person is writing this story and telling the emperor about what is going on. The end of this book slapped, the middle of this book slapped, the beginning of this book slapped. This book was so, 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 so good. This is an adult high epic fantasy, so it, it is a little bit complicated, it is a little bit convoluted, it is a little bit confusing. Jen Leons went into the story trying to write it a confusing book, but the payoff was so good. I can't get over how amazing this book was and I can't wait to read the rest of it. There are dragons, there is magic, there is crime, there is character development, there are awful 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 things that happen. I will give trigger warnings for this book. There is on page rape that happens and it does genuinely affect the characters that it happens to and that is one of the things that I actually enjoyed is watching these characters have genuine reactions to horrible things and have to deal with them for years because some of the things are awful that happen to them and it's not something that you would get over really quickly. One of our main characters is this shapeshifter who can turn into people that she has killed. And there's also this whole entire element of like people shifting souls with other people. It gets super confusing. But one of the things that's amazing is Jen is there to help you out. She not only gives you a map at the beginning of the book to help you understand everything and a glossary to help you with the words that are kind of confusing, but she also gives you a family tree that I don't recommend checking out until you've made it a good way through the book because it does have some spoilers for the ending. And she also gives you an appendix of all the royal houses. There are quite a few of them. They each have their own color and their own symbol, and it can be kind of confusing to figure out who's doing what and what they rule over. 
So she really does help you get through the story and she really does help you understand everything. This is not a book to sit down and binge in one sitting. It is a book to sit and read and you're gonna be flipping back and forth between different sections and trying to understand. I, if I could get any fantasy reader to read one book, well, it's it's gonna be the queen of the tier link, but then it's gonna be the ruin of kings. Oh, we're about halfway through. So let's take a break to do some stretching. Next up, we're going to be talking about the book my Dark Vanessa, I am shocked that a contemporary story made it on this list, but this book was so genuinely good. I had been having a friend telling me to read this book for months, and then finally I was like, okay, let's do it. My library has the audiobook, how bad can it be? bad. So this is the story of a young girl who her teacher at school, a, an adult man, starts a romantic relationship with her and grooms her into his perfect little side piece. It is about her life mostly when she is older. I believe she's in her early 20s and she's no longer seeing this man, but she is seeing a lot of allegations come out about him in the press about other girls that he did the same thing to. And it is about her coming to terms with the fact that she genuinely thinks that she seduced him and that she is the reason why they had a relationship at all and that he is not at fault, that she loved him and he loved her and so it was a real genuine relationship and she doesn't understand why these other girls are being so upset about this relationship that they asked for. And you flip back and forth between her seeing these press allegations and her past when this man started a relationship with her and it is just eerie to see everything happen and how it went down and how impactful this man was on her life and how he genuinely gaslighted her and groomed her and turned her into something that she was never supposed to be. It was such a good hard-hitting book. I almost cried. I don't believe I actually cried in the story if I remember properly, but I was up late at night reading this. I think I read it in about 24 hours, but it was over the course of two days. I remember sitting on my apartment floor after coming back from like an evening walk with my giant headphones on listening to it, just unable to move because I was so in shock of everything that was happening. And I was so angry for our main character and I was so sad because she she thought it was her fault and she didn't believe that this man could be as horrible as he was and she to a degree loved him. This book has been talked about a lot on booktube and it is a, a hard-hitting favorite of a lot of people. I truly truly think it is such an important book to read and it is so good but there are so many trigger warnings in it and I do recommend doing some research to it before you start reading this book because it was very very triggering and I actually had a genuinely hard time reading some of the topics that it discussed. The one thing in particular that really upset me when reading this book was our main girl getting rid of all of her friendships because of this form of abusive relationship that she is in. And it's something that I've seen so many of my friends do in the past where they enter into this obsessive relationship and then suddenly no longer wish to be friends with someone and turn it into this means of attack against this other person. So that was something I was not ready to face in this book and it left me shooketh. Up next we're going to be talking about The Deep by Nick Cutter. Is this our first real horror? I think this is our first real horror on this list because Ocean at the Land of the Lane is like a mix between horror and fantasy. Um, I love it. I love it so much. Last year uh, The Troop did make it on my favorites of the year list. I actually filmed that video before I read The Troop so it didn't make it in the video but if you read my little description it made it into there. Friggin loved The Troop. I read The Deep and it was pretty much just as good. I do think I kind of liked the troop slightly more, but they're both five stars and I think about them both so much. Oh, so The Deep is about this man who is a 
veterinarian. <laughs> I don't know why that took me so long to say. Uh, he is a veterinarian and his brother is this like big bad scientist. Anyways, I don't know why I'm talking like this right now. Anyways, I'm getting a little loopy. It's been a lot of talking. He is called by this uh, scientific group to come and figure out why his brother has gone MIA because his brother was at the bottom of the ocean studying this disease that has kind of plagued the entire world and is killing people off and it is destroying families. Uh, lots and lots of people have died because of it and pretty much everyone in the world has either been uh, affected by it themselves or a loved one has been affected by it. So it's a huge disease. It's a huge issue. The main part of the story is about our main character going down in this uh, submarine down. I think it's like eight miles deep into the ocean and it is about him trying to confront his brother having memories from when they were children and he grew up with this psychopath of a family like everyone in his family were just having so many issues it's not about redemption it's not a story about learning like oh my brother isn't who i thought he was going to be it's a story about this creature that they think can solve their issues and can heal everyone coming to destroy humanity and it Oh, it's another book with an open ending. It's another book with some really hard hitting moments. And it's another book with some really disgusting scenes and some really scary thoughts. So I mean, basically you get most of the story is underneath the ocean. So you're trapped in this small vehicle. You've got villains on every side. You have enemies everywhere. You got people dying, being taken apart. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's great. It has a lot of body horror. It does have some animal abuse in it. So be prepared for that because the brother does experiments with animals. There is animal death on page and it's hard to read, but if you can read it, this book was so good. It has an open ending, which I love, and it left me going, ah! oh my god, this was like back to back to back. My favorites were really hard hitters and I don't know why that is. Eventually we'll get into something more lighter again, but for the time being we're going to be talking about Firekeeper's Daughter. I loved this book. This was so Good. I think this is one of the first few books I read in this new apartment. I do think I read The Deep while I was moving. I don't think I was fully in this place when I read it, but I read this here and I loved it. This book is an indigenous voice story about an indigenous girl who lives in this reservation where there are some crimes becoming more and more important. And I believe it's the FBI. I'm not totally sure which branch of investigation it is. It is the FBI. Come to investigate and try to rope her into investigating people in her community. And she kind of decides to agree to do it because her uncle was killed a few months ago. And she is worried about some bigger issues coming about. Her main goal is that she wants to go off to college and she wants to study to be a scientist and her and her best friend have agreed to go to college together at the beginning at this school and it's about her trying to bring true goodness to her people and to try to stop the issues from happening. It's about her falling in love. It's about her falling out of love. It's about her just being a high school student trying to deal with adult type problems. Loved our main character. She goes through so much in this book and she comes out so strong and she just, I just want to give her a hug so bad. She genuinely needs a hug more than anyone else I know. It made me cry. It made me happy. It made me mad. It made me feel horrible. It has all of the range of emotions that you can imagine being in a book and it's just a really really good story. Next up we're going to be talking about another horror book but this is a YA horror and it shocked me how good this book was and that is Rules for Vanishing. I loved this book so much. So the catchphrase on this book is anyone can follow the road but few will leave it alive. So this is a mixed media book. Not all of it is told in mixed media, but there are large mixed media chunks in it. And it is about this girl who is talking to like a podcast investigator about this weird instance that happened to her and her sister. So the story of her and her sister is that a year ago, her sister disappeared because they were playing with something called the road. And because of this, all of their friends kind of broke up and are no longer friends with each other. With the approach of the one year anniversary, a text message gets sent around the school saying that the road is open. If they want the sister back that they should walk the entirety of it and they will get her. 
our main girl along with a few of her friends. What is that? I think there's a spoiler. I think there's like a little Easter egg on the front cover. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I, it took me a long time to realize that this was a woman here within the trees. Main girl with along of a few of her friends decide to walk the road and there are a few rules that they have to follow. I don't know if I can remember it. Uh, but the little thing up here says, once a year, a road appears in the forest, and at the end of it, the ghost of Lucy Gallows beckons. Lucy's game isn't for the faint of heart. If you win, you escape with your life, but if you lose, dot, dot, dot. And so they're kind of trying to escape Lucy as she is going to possibly kill them on this road. The road has different sections. The book is just like a weird, like, it's a weird trip. So there are characters that go missing, and you don't even notice it. They go missing from one sentence to another, and you just minds are messed with, characters are erased, things are undone. A lot of what you're following is like testaments of characters telling their story, but some of it is like video that has been transcribed or text messages that have been shared. It is marked as an Ashford file and it is number 74. So I really, really hope that the author decides to write some of the other files because this was fantastic so good next up we're going to be talking about another series specifically my favorites of the year are guild and glint but i'll also just throw a gleam on here too because why not i rated this one five stars but it doesn't quite make it as good as the other two i really loved this series and i was kind of shocked by how much i did love it so it is a new adult fantasy romance dark fantasy retelling of king midas and we are following our main character named Orin, and she is a girl made of gold and she lives in king midas's palace and basically just has to do whatever he wants and you get some flashbacks of how she got there you get some story of why she's still kept there and King Midas is not a good person it does have Stockholm syndrome he's not supposed to be the main love interest if you read any notes on the story you will know that I see a lot of people DNFing or quitting the book one chapter in because they really hate King Midas he's not supposed to be someone you like he's supposed to be someone you hate Midas has married into the throne because he can turn things to gold and he has basically flourished the kingdom with riches. This is going to be a four-part series. The fourth book is coming out in 2022. I'm so excited to be reading it. The cover just got released this past week and it is my most anticipated book of this year. Our main character Orin does have these ribbons which are completely made out of gold and she can control them like they're extra limbs. It is a dark, dark, dark tale. There is war, there is politics, there are pirates, there is rape, there is murder, there is lots of issues. You don't get into uh, King Rip, who is one of the kings of the other realms until some of the later books, but he is such a great character and he is so interesting to read about and I absolutely love where they went with this series. If you like fantasy romance and you have not checked out these books, I highly recommend you do check them out. They are my favorite fantasy romance that I have read so far. Next up is a book that should surprise no one and that is going to be Leviathan Wakes. In specific, this entire series is good and is my favorite sci-fi series of all time, but my favorites in the series are the first book, which is Leviathan Wakes, and the third book, which is Abaddon's Gate. I freaking, mm, if you like space opera, high sci-fi, this is a series that you need to be checking out. So we are following in book one, two POVs. This girl has gone missing and is bringing a war to the galaxy because of her being missing. We are following James Holden, who used to be an ice transporter and his ship got destroyed because they were investigating into things that they shouldn't be touching and he starts to learn some truths about the world and releases these truths to the entire galaxy and now lots of people are out for his head. He teams up eventually with this man named Miller who is a detective who is the one investigating that girl's missingness and the two of them cause a lot of problems, cause a lot of good. Uh, there are these like zombie-like creatures that eventually become a large part of the story and are trying to destroy everyone. It was just so good. I love the thoughts of death and life that this book had to bring about. It does of course have a lot of philosophical ideas to it. The later books continue on with the Holden storyline but introduce new characters into every single story as different POVs. So this book we are following uh, I think it's like three other people besides Holden. The war is still brewing. The war is still about to happen. More aliens, more expanse is happening. The world is growing 
time for how we know it and you really get to see a lot of issues between earthers and belters or people who grew up in low gravity and you get to see a lot of it reflect racism in current day. You get to see a lot of other great issues that are brought about. These books have so much representation in them and it is such a natural part of the stories and I just they were so good. Next up we're going to be talking about a book that has a very special place in my heart made me cry uncontrollably and will definitely be in my top 10 books of all time if not my favorite fifth place book. I don't know. I haven't fully decided yet. It needs a reread for me to decide, but it was so good. Anyways, that book is The Sword of Kaigen. This, I swear, I swear, I don't even know how to talk about this book because it is so much more than its plot. It is so much more than what I can tell you about. It's about women being trapped and equality and traditional values versus modern values. But the main plot of the story is about this small town in an Asian inspired country where they are on the brink of war and their enemies are coming to destroy them. And this small town has been worshiped and graced with warriors its whole life. And the empire always says that they're doing such a great job and we're seeing this attack start against these people. We follow a few different POVs. We're following this family very specifically. There is this mom who used to be a soldier back when she was like in high school. Her family let her train before she went off and got married. We're following her oldest son as he is becoming a man and he is starting to realize the world is not as he thought it was going to be. And we do get a brief glimpse into the father who he is the second born son so he has some control but is more limited than his older brother. It's literally them just all preparing for war. One of the things that really shocked me going into this story is it does have magic but the magic isn't a huge part of the story but it is kind of important to some things. So it has elemental magic but majority of the characters that we follow have the ability to control water or ice. Let's talk about the last horror on this list which is the Chalk Man. Yeah, this one really surprised me. The Chalk Man is an it-esque story. So if you've read It by Stephen King, it is similar to that story. And it is about this man It is telling the story of his life, part in the past and part in the future. So the future storyline is him dealing with the memories of what happened to him in the past. They are trying to get the story out of him exactly as to what happened. And it is him trying to figure out why some of the things from the past seem to be haunting him again. The past takes place in the 1980s, so any kind of trigger warnings that you get in a general 1980s book be prepared for, but it's him being a young child trying to have fun, trying to go to the fair. He sees this girl die right in front of him and he is kind of affected by that. His friends develop this game with him where they have these chalk men to tell each other stories and stuff and to give each other like almost like texting but with like chalk left in different places and it helps them solve this crime. Oh my god the story sounds so crazy when you don't know all the connecting features. They uh, end up finding this dead body and so when he's an adult he starts to notice the chalk men are showing up again and he's worried about things happening again for a second time. It was such a good book. I do genuinely like horror written about small children. I like horror that takes place kind of in two timelines, one in the past, one in the future. I like horror that has a group of kids dealing with something in their past and then it reflecting their future. Kind of this idea of like they didn't solve everything and now it's coming back to haunt them again. Okay next up is another YA book that made it on the list and that is Not Even Bones. This is a YA dystopia about this girl whose mother hunts down illegal magical creatures and then her daughter dissects them and they sell them on the black market. Her and her mother are illegal magical creatures. They have the ability to heal themselves but they have kind of stayed under the radar their entire lives. It is a dark dark dystopian story. It has lots of horrible things, lots of gory bloody things that happen on page. I love the romance that has started to develop in this series. I have read the first two books and both of them were fantastic. And also just kind of her realizing like what even is a monster and what is a bad thing and can is there truly evil in the world? Yes, but am I truly evil in the world? 
I don't know. You'll have to read the book to find out what she decides. It is super international, which was so great and such a fun thing to read about. The book takes place, well, book one takes place in Peru, book two takes place in Canada, and it is very much not United States centric. There are myths and legends from all over the world, and the main language that's spoken in book one, I believe, is Spanish. Of course, it says things like, oh, hello there, friend, he said in Spanish. So it's not really in Spanish, but uh, knowing some Spanish would not hurt when reading this book. I truly, truly loved it. I loved our characters so much. They are very dark and morally gray characters. If you're looking for a good morally gray character arc, this is a great one. I love the love interest so much, and I can't even tell you who he is or his significance to the story because it is a huge spoiler. Next up is The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. I loved this book so much and I wasn't prepared for how much I was going to love it. So we're following a few different characters in this story and I'm not even going to get into all of them to be honest here. I'm just going to touch on kind of the main ones that are the focus of what you need to know to get into this book. Basically the plot of the story is this whole entire land is on the brink of war and our main characters uh, are slowly coming together to stop said war. They don't realize they're coming together to stop the war, but by the end, that's what they're doing. So we're following Logan, who believes that his entire family has been killed off, his entire people have been killed off, and he's trying to find purpose again in the world. He used to be a soldier, a leader in an army, and he has nine fingers, and he is such a fun character to follow. We are also following Proctor, who used to also be a soldier, but he was captured by the enemy and tortured for months on end and now he is brutally disformed. When he came back to the king, the king honored him by saying you were such a great soldier and you didn't crack under pressure, now you're going to be my top torturer. And he tortures people and he teaches other people how to torture people for a living. For the king. We're also following Giselle who is this uh, fancy boy. He's pretty high up in the ranking but he thinks he's better than he actually is. And he is joining this fencing competition where he is going to have to fight in honor of the king but he soon realizes that by fencing in this competition, he's just showing the king that he is a great soldier who should be sent off to war, and he's not sure that's actually something he wants to do. We've also got uh, Farah. She wants justice for her people. She is out to kill as many people as she can. She's angry. She's an archer. She's a badass. She is so cool. There's a few other POVs that we do get to have. I'm not going to go into any more than that, to be honest, but it was just a fantastic book with amazing characters, amazing writing, some great fantasy scenes, some great fighting scenes. I don't normally like fighting scenes and this one had such a good one that I absolutely loved. It stuck with me. It was enjoyable to read. I highly recommend checking out Joe Abercrombie and I can't wait to be reading Before They're Hanged. I've read like one chapter of it so far and it's really good so far. I've only read one of his books and Joe Abercrombie is now going to be one of my favorite authors of all time. I can promise you that. I can't wait to read more of his works. Two more! So next up we have Empire of the Vampire and I did do an entire reading vlog just on this book so if you want to see a bunch of spoilers for this book you can go and check that out but I'll be talking about the non-spoilers here right now. So this is the story of Gabriel and he is, guess what, in a prison at the end of the story telling the past story of his life. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Anyways, I apparently really enjoy people being in prison telling their life stories books. I also enjoy The Name of the Wind. He's not in prison, but he's telling his life story. Anyways, Gabriel is telling his life story. The first bit is when he was a child and he became a silver saint and I'm not going to tell you what that means specifically, but they go out and hunt vampires. And the second half is after he is left being a silver saint and he is out helping this woman named Chloe find the Holy Grail because many, many years ago the sun set and it never returned and because of the sun disappearing it has allowed vampires to rise up in the world and they believe that the Holy Grail will help bring the sun back and help bring down vampires once and for all. Well, the writing is super good. The story is super good. The plot is interesting. It is more of a slower story, but it has such great world building and lore to it that it was just so fantastic to read the entire time. It also has, I can't show you that one, that's a spoiler, illustrations throughout which relate to the fact that his story is being told by a historian, is being wrapped up, and the historian is like drawing these pictures while he is telling them. You can see 
see in my copy that I do have a few black pages throughout. Those are all the pages that made me cry. It does have some LGBTQ plus representation, but it's not part of our main Gabriel's storyline. It is part of side character storylines, but let me tell you, I was so into them. I was so into so many of the side characters. This was such a good book. Jay Kristoff has like a fun, humorous writing style. There's a talking sword in this book. There are sisters who fight, like nuns who fight. There are vampires. There's darkness. There is blood, violence, gore, sex. Everything you could want in a high fantasy, all set against a French timeline. Finally, we're at the end and we're gonna be talking about the last book that made it on this list. I'm gonna shift a little bit because I'm uncomfortable. The Bone Season. This is an adult dystopian story about a girl named Paige, who is a clairvoyance, and clairvoyancy is illegal in this world. Clairvoyancy basically means that you have the ability to communicate with the ether or with ghosts in some way, shape, or form. There are different kinds of clairvoyance. Paige is this very rare type of clairvoyance, so lots of people want her and want her on their side and want to use her. At the beginning of the story, commits a crime because she is part of this gang, and because of that she is sent off to this prison type place called Oxford. And there she starts to realize that the world is not how she thought it was supposed to be. She starts to learn more about her gift. She starts to learn about these crazy creatures that are living in her world. This is going to be part of a seven book series. There are four books out currently. I do own the first three of them. All of them were used library copies, which I love. That's so much fun. This is not a book for someone who wants to sit down and just read an easy book. This is hard to read, hard to get through. The language is kind of hard to understand at certain points and clairvoyancy really is not explained to you in super detail and not until maybe like the 200-300 page mark and even then there are still some questions that you're going to be facing. With saying that though, this book was so good and totally worth reading and I genuinely like, I know I'm late to the game with this one. This book was published a long time ago, 2013. And I actually liked it more than Priory of the Orange Tree, which is Samantha Shannon's other book. If you want to read a difficult adult dystopian book, this is the one for you. There is a small romance in the story. It doesn't really take place until near the end. I think it's going to be much more important to later books, but most of the story is just Paige trying to figure out how things are going and trying to start a revolution. Anyways, that was all of the books. I can't even pick up the stack because it's like three piles next to me. I'll just pick up these four. These are the last four I held up and talked to you about. Let me know down below if you have a list of favorite books of the year or if you have a video or what your absolute favorite book of the year was. I think mine is The Queen of the Tearling, but also Rules for Vanishing, Empire of the Vampire, Ruin of Kings definitely take a run for its money. Anyways, I'm so tired. My throat hurts. I'm gonna go take a nap. Oh, no, I'm gonna go read because I need to go read some more. Thank you for watching. If, oh, if you've made it this far, what should you leave me? What emoji should you leave me? Leave me the thumbs up emoji because this was a long video to get through and I appreciate you for making it to the end. You are fantastic and I, I love you. I love you. Anyways, uh, thank you for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. I don't remember how my outro goes, but until next time, I will talk to you in the comments. Bye.